Afternoon, everyone. The first item of business today is portfolio questions. And in order to get as many people in as possible, we're grateful for short and succinct questions and indeed answers to match. Question one, Siobhan McMahon. To ask the Scottish Government what impact the autumn statement and comprehensive spending review will have on its capital budgets. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary John Swinney. President Officer, the autumn statement announcement confirmed that we face significant further austerity over the coming years. When the Conservative Party formed the Coalition UK Government in 2010-11, the Scottish Government's conventional capital budget was £3.239 billion. By 2019-20, the capital budget in Scotland will be £3.187 billion. Accounting for inflation, the capital budget will be £600 million less than it was in 2010-11. Much, McMahon. Thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. The Scottish Government have indicated that it plans to make energy efficiency a national infrastructure priority. However, it is not clear what this will mean in practice. Can the Cabinet Secretary therefore outline whether there are plans to increase capital spending as a result of Barnet consequentials into its plans to make energy efficiency a national infrastructure priority, which would help reduce climate change emissions and stop people from suffering from ill health effects of cold and poor quality housing? I think Mr. Man makes a, a, a very good and strong point about the multiple positive benefits of investment in, um, in energy efficiency measures in relation to the tackling of fuel poverty and involved in improving the health and well-being of individuals and also as an economic contribution as a consequence. So I, I fundamentally accept and agree with the analysis that she has expressed. Um, clearly, the Government is making choices just now about the composition of our capital budget. I will announce that to Parliament next Wednesday. And uh, we will also um, be setting out our thinking in relation to the National Infrastructure Plan, which of course is the means by which we gather together the investment and infrastructure priorities of the Government over a longer period of time uh, to ensure a strong pipeline of investment activity over a number of years. Thanks. Question two, Neil Bibby. To ask the Scottish Government what impact its budget will have on the economy of the West Scotland region. Cabinet Secretary. Presiding Officer, the Scottish Government will continue to support the West of Scotland through a wide range of programmes and public expenditure. As one example, on the 26th of November, I informed Parliament that investment through the hub programme in the Inverclyde Care Home, Our Lady and St Patrick's High School and Barhead High School could proceed. These programmes will make an enormous difference in their communities, not just in the jobs that their construction will bring, but in the health and education benefits they will bring to local people. The Government will publish its future spending plans on the 16th of December. Thank you. Neil Bibby. Thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. According to the ONS, since 2009 there has been a reduction of 62,000 public sector jobs in Scotland, many of them in the West Scotland region. There are now estimates that around 30,000 public sector jobs could be lost in Scotland by 2020. Units in Scotland have rightly said we can't keep slammy slicing public sector jobs. Audit Scotland have highlighted the very serious impact this is having. Will Mr Swinney therefore agree to Unison's reasonable request and work with them to set up a task force to look at the future of public sector employment in Scotland and support the public sector workers who face losing their jobs? Mr Swinney. The first point I'd say to Mr Bibby is that uh, I uh, I am a very strong believer, and the government takes the same. Takes, and I am proud to serve in a government that takes the same view, that the investment in public services and in the work of public servants is wise investment for the well-being of our country. So I very much regret the fact that we have lost public sector employment over the course of the last five years. But I am sure Mr. Bibby will understand and accept the importance that the government has to live within its means. And we've had to wrestle with the challenges of the austerity agenda from the United Kingdom government. I think Mr. Bibby, however, makes a valuable point, um, which was certainly made by the trade unions that I met this morning at the biannual meeting of the uh, Scottish Trade Unions Congress and trade unions with the First Minister and myself, in which many of the uh, aspirations that Mr. Bibby set out there were expressed by the trade unions of a willingness to uh, work to ensure that we create the strongest possible platform for public sector employment and public services within Scotland, and that's an approach that I very much welcome. I would, of course, say to Mr Bibby that the government has taken an approach since 2008, uh, or perhaps nine, where we have had a guarantee of no compulsory redundancies within the public sector. And I think that's been an important character of the nature of the relationship that we've had, that we've worked with the public sector workforce to find the most effective way of wrestling with the financial challenges that we face. 
Thank you. Supplementary from Alec Rowley. Hey, thank you, President Officer. One of the areas where local authorities are under massive pressure is health and social care and the, uh, the growing um, pressures on social care budgets. Given the relationship with the NHS, the Deputy First Minister has protected the NHS. Does he recognise that actually social care should be funded as part of that protection? about the west of Scotland, but you may answer first, I'm sure, first Minister. I'm, I'm certain there's health and social care in the west of Scotland, if I can help, if I can help Mr. Mr Rowley in that respect. And, I, and I'll, I'll manage his telephone calls uh, in the future as well, if that would be helpful too. Um, the, uh, Mr Rowley makes a, a, a substantive point. There are, um, in, in, when citizens require the support of our public services, we have to make sure that they are supported in the most appropriate circumstances and surroundings and given the most appropriate type of care. And as we know, um, there are individuals who are cared for in a, 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 a care setting which is not appropriate to their needs. It may actually be, a, a, it may well be an acute hospital, which they don't need to be in. So therefore, we, we I think, have to be very careful to ensure that we focus on the needs of the individual citizens of Scotland to make sure they are supported and cared for in exactly the right circumstances. And I think some of these issues, I'm sure, will be the subject of this afternoon's debate, which um, will be interesting to observe. Um, but the uh, approach and the distinction that Mr uh, Rowley makes, uh, whether it's in the west of Scotland or anywhere else in Scotland, is an important uh, point to me. Yes, helpful if we can stick to the question asked, please. Question three, John McAlpine. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government what discussions it has had with the UK Government on its plan to reduce the renewable heat incentive by 40 per cent. Minister Fergus Hugh. Um, I have been engaged in extensive communications with UK Government over a prolonged period, calling for them to continue the renewable heat incentive and give confidence to householders and business and the wider heat market. There has been no detailed discussion about the £700 million efficiency in the budget over the period to 2021, which I presume your 40% refers to, nor about the detail of changes to the RHI, regardless of the fact that I have consistently requested this. Thanks. John McAlpine. I thank the Minister for that answer. Um, what are the knock-on effects of this UK policy change? on the Scottish Government investment in energy efficiency schemes such as Home Energy Scotland Renewables Loan Scheme and other measures aimed at tackling fuel poverty? Minister. Well, the uh, announcement made by the Chancellor cannot aid investment because it lacks what is required. A parliamentary statement should be characterised by clarity. Instead, Mr Osborne's statement, insofar as it related to the RHI, is characterised by opacity. It is as though, instead, he was instead of uh, devising a parliamentary statement, he was making up a crossword clue whose purpose was to guide people away from the actual answer and meaning. And therefore, we are pressing the UK government for clarity. But I'm pleased that uh, the RHI scheme uh, a, the amendments will not take effect until 2017, and that in Scotland over 45 million has been paid to accredited installations since the introduction of the RHI in November 2011. Thanks. Sarah Byatt. Can I thank the uh, Minister for that answer? I think that's very useful. Uh, in that opportunity of between now and 2017, what new schemes can we see being brought forward? Um, because there is general agreement that renewable heat is the missing link in terms of our energy and heat, um, in terms of green energy, but also in terms of green jobs and apprenticeships. Minister. Well, I think Sarah Boyack raises a very good point. Just yesterday, I uh, had the privilege of opening in the uh, Borders College campus in Galashiels, a brand new uh, waste to energy scheme provide, uh, providing heat uh, in an excellent scheme where the costs are clear and guaranteed. Uh, also, we have a low carbon uh, infrastructure transition scheme with investment of 76 million pounds or thereby. Uh, and uh, we also have further investments. And in, in regard to the question, can I give some specific examples? We are seeking to incentivize geothermal solutions, uh, one potentially in Aberdeen serving the proposed new conference center there. And we are also looking at uh, water-sourced heat pumps. 
while seeking to bring forward all these schemes, presiding officer, we do not have the legal competence or responsibility for energy, and therefore the limited budgets that we have, we seek to use to best effect for demonstrator projects. Uh, but nonetheless, we are taking forward schemes, which I hope would receive the approval of Ms. Boyack and uh, across the chamber. Okay, thanks. Question four, Alison McInnes. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government what action it has taken to support the Aberdeen City Region deal bid since it received a statement of intent. Thank you. Cabinet Secretary John Sweeney. President Officer, Aberdeen City Council and Aberdeenshire Council submitted the statement of intent to both the Scottish and United Kingdom governments on the 4th of September. Since then, Scottish Government officials have been working closely with both councils and the UK Government, pr providing support as the councils develop their proposals. The Scottish Government Cities team has met regularly with representatives from both councils and officials from a number of policy areas including housing, innovation, digital connectivity and Transport Scotland have provided ongoing support and been involved in detailed discussions around proposals. The Scottish Government continues to work closely with both councils as proposals evolve. Can I Alice thank McInnes. the Cabinet Secretary for that answer? Uh, the Chancellor referenced the negotiations on the City Region deal in his autumn statement and spending review, which was welcome. And then he went on to make a decision regarding CCS funding, which effectively sabotaged one of the North East's key projects. Given the economic importance of the North East to Scotland's economy, will the Finance Secretary back the CRD, the City Region deal, in his budget statement next week? And unlike the UK Government decision, will he make sure the budget decisions he takes complements and supports the various strands of the, the, the City Region deal rather than, than undermining them? I, I, I certainly I, I agree with the point that Alison McInnes has made about the importance of taking complementary decisions and I think the, the, I, I am absolutely with her about the uh, disappointment about the uh, Peterhead decision. It, it is a, a very regrettable decision on a technology that uh, I think could have created a, a global, well still can create a global opportunity for Scotland but it's undoubtedly been interrupted by the arbitrary decision that was made in the spending review. Um, as I've indicated to uh, Alison McInnes, the Government is very supportive and sympathetic towards the Aberdeen City deal and we are working constructively with the, uh, the two councils uh, to take this forward and also I would say with the local business community and it's a really welcome step that Serene Wood has taken to give leadership to the Aberdeen and Aberdeenshire business community uh, in, well, uh, in recent days uh, very formally. Uh, obviously, the city deals are a joint venture with the United Kingdom Government, so we'll work collaboratively with the UK Government to try to advance these proposals to ensure that Aberdeen and Aberdeenshire continue to make a strong contribution to the Scottish economy. Lewis MacDonald. Thank you very much, and uh, welcome the Cabinet Secretary's words. Can he confirm when he anticipates the Scottish Government, together with the UK Government, making a decision on the city deal proposals? I, I can't give Mr Macdonald a definitive decision, as I've just indicated to Alison McInnes. Uh, these are joint matters uh, to be pursued with the United Kingdom Government, and I think it's better if we take these uh, issues forward in a spirit of partnership and collaboration, and that's exactly what we're trying to do. But it will, we'll make sure that uh, progress is timely and uh, any announcement is made as quickly as possible. Thanks. Question five, Kenny Gibson. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what impact the reductions in its resource budget from 2016 to 2020, announcing the autumn statement and spending review will have on public sector jobs and services. Presiding officer, the Chancellor's continued programme of austerity of choice, not necessity, will see Scotland's fiscal resource Dell budget, the budget responsible for day-to-day -day spending in Scotland, decrease in real terms by almost 6% over the course of the next spending review period. The Scottish Government will continue to strive to minimise the impact of the austerity agenda on jobs, investment and services in Scotland. Kenny Gibson. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer, but does the Cabinet, Cabinet Secretary agree that continued year-on-year -year cuts to Scotland's funding imposed as a result of UK austerity ultimately can only result in a serious decline in both the quality of public services, the breadth of those services and the loss of many important services that do not have a statutory underpinning? There are clearly very significant challenges that arise as a consequence of the continued restraint on public expenditure. And this affects the ability to invest and to, uh, to, to take forward the public services for which we are responsible. I would say, however, presiding officer, that one of the objectives that the Scottish Government has always taken forward in this climate of austerity has been to try to protect uh, jobs, investment and services in Scotland. 
That may involve us delivering services in a different fashion to the way in which we have delivered them in the past, but that may be necessary to ensure that members of the public, the people for whom we are elected to serve, are not in any way uh, damaged in their access to public services as a consequence. So the environment in which we operate uh, is a very constrained fiscal environment. It requires us to be prepared to embrace reform in our public services, but throughout that journey, the Scottish Government will be determined to protect jobs, investment and services in Scotland. Many thanks. Jackie Bailey. The Deputy First Minister will be aware that local government's share of the budget has dropped from 29% in 2011-12 to 25% in 2014-15. Um, with departmental spending for health and, as I understand it, the police protected, what level does he envisage local government share to be for this coming year? I, I'm, I'm not Upset. at all uh, sure the basis of the numbers that Jackie Bailey has cited to Parliament today, but uh, obviously I'll, uh, I'll look carefully at the points that she's made. But what I would say is that local government has been... Uh, very effectively protected by the Scottish Government during a period of significant restraint. Um, Jackie Bailey and her colleagues, I think, I think, agree with the Government with the decisions that we have taken about investing in the health service. And if they have, then what they, if they agree with those decisions, they will find that once the increases in expenditure have been delivered to the health service, local government's share of the remaining budget has increased as a consequence. So, uh, I'm not quite sure what point Jackie Bailey is trying to make if she agrees with the government on health expenditure. I think the point she's possibly making is that she wants me to spend the same money twice. And that, that, is, of course, that is, of course, the familiar approach of the Labour Party, but it's not a way to balance the books. And I can only spend the money the once. And what the Scottish Government has done over time has been to deliver a strong and sustainable settlement for local authorities within Scotland. Many thanks. John Pentland, briefly. Cabinet Secretary, earlier uh, today you said you, have, you value public sector workers and their jobs will be protected. So will the Scottish Government budget recognise and compensate councils who under the SNP have suffered real-term cuts that were double those imposed by the UK and Scotland? as shown recently by a space briefing. The Secretary. I, I, don't think, I, I don't think I've got much to add to the answer that I gave to Jackie Bailey, because obviously the, the, uh, the Labour Party's uh, condition must be endemic across its benches about wishing to spend the same money twice. But what the Scottish Government has done, as, uh, and I, uh, I'm sure Mr Pentland must agree with me, even if Jackie Bailey doesn't agree with me, that the Government was right to invest in the health service. I, I, th I had thought the Labour Party was supportive of health investment, but if they're not, then that's a revelation. Uh, but assuming they support us on that point, local government's share of the, of the remaining budget has increased under this government. And I think that represents the strong and emphatic commitment the Scottish Government has given to local authority spending in Scotland. Many thanks. Uh, question six, in the name of Jenny Mara, has not been lodged and a less than satisfactory explanation has been provided. Question seven, Neil Finlay. To ask the Scottish Government whether its non-profit distributing programme is regarded by the Office for National Statistics as a public sector programme. Secretary John Smith. Officer, I explained in my statement to Parliament on the 26th of November 2015 that a rapid reversal of the Office for National Statistics public classification of the Aberdeen Western Peripheral Route project under the revised Eurostat rules will not be possible. I have, however, asked the Scottish Futures Trust to continue to review options for the potential amendment of the AWPR project and other MPD projects. This follows the Office for National Statistics' welcome decision on the revised hub model and confirmation that the projects being delivered by the model will be classified to the private sector. There will be no impact on the cost of the delivery of the Aberdeen Western Peripheral Route project uh, or indeed other MPD projects currently in consideration. Thanks, Neil Finlay. Uh, the Finance Secretary and his party have regularly claimed that NPD and hub projects are different from PFI and PPP. Meanwhile, the ONS have said that these are private sector projects, an announcement that was warmly welcomed by the Cabinet Secretary. So given that and one of the other issues with the non-profit distributing model is that it distributes profit, uh, is it not time that the Cabinet Secretary apologise for misleading Parliament and the electorate 
because NPD is just PFI with a more cuddly name. Well, there's nothing cuddly about Mr Finlay or his <laughs> questions. I, I, I'm, I'm mightily confused by Mr Finlay's question. I have always maintained and, and, and have put forward information to the Office for National Statistics, and I've been completely open with Parliament about this, with the objective of securing a private sector classification for the, for the NPD projects and for the hub programme, for the simple reason that that delivers the ability to, to, del to deliver additionality in the economy. And by creating additionality in our capital programme, that creates jobs and investment. And in, a recent, and in a recent SPICE briefing, it indicated the scale and the impact of the government's capital programme on the creation of jobs and the growth in the economy within Scotland. Now, the big difference, of course, uh, between NPD and PFI is the concept of profit capping. And profit capping was brought in by this government to make sure that the rampant profits of PFI profiteers that were presided over by the Labour Party were brought to an end. Now, the fact that the ONS has now decided that those projects are to be classified to the public sector, I think rather refutes the point and the accusation that Mr Finlay was levelling at me. Dr Richard Simpson. Um, I don't think I can thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer, but I suppose I must out of courtesy, because I agree with my colleague Dr. Finlay, uh, Mr Finlay about the... Uh, end. Question, Dr Simpson, well, that's moving a swiftly on. Sorry, it's an anticipatory reflection of his intellect. Um, but can I ask him seriously about the, the ONS decision? I'm, I'm quite concerned about the charity element, the 20% charity element, as to how he's going to construct that. Will he give us an early indication of, of how that 20% uh, charitable input is going to be dealt with? Because it has to be in the private sector, therefore it can't be government. Are the government going to appoint the people on it? Can we get some more detail, or at least an indication of when he might give us some more detail? I think we were verging there on hearing about Dr Finlay's casebook. <laughs> <laughs> but um, the, the, uh, Dr, fin uh, Dr Simpson raises a where well, I'm at it as well. Um, heaven, heaven forfend if, <laughs> if Mr Finlay ever has to attend to me in a doctor's capacity. That, that, will be, that will be. I'd put my faith in Dr Simpson before Mr Finlay on that point. But... Um, <laughs> If, if I can move on to answer the question, presiding officer, if you would, um, the, the, uh, Dr. Simpson raises a, a substantive issue, and for the, for the charitable uh, organisation to satisfy the test that is required of it under the ONS decision, it must operate out with the scope and the uh, intervention and direction of government. So it, it, it has to operate in that fashion. And it has to satisfy the requirements of the Office of the Charity Regulator in Scotland. And that process is underway to secure that classification. I'm very happy to provide Parliament with an update on the governance arrangements and the regulatory arrangements. But uh, I hope those uh, two key principles, that it must act um, independent, utterly independently of government, uh, which I suspect probably means that um, appointment of members would not be able to be undertaken by government. But So we'll have to what are the details of, of all of that um, and to satisfy the office of the charity regulator will address some of his points but I'll happily, I will of course put more details on the public record when those are to hand Many thanks Question 8 in the name of Annabel Goldie has not been lodged, apparently a satisfactory explanation has been provided Question 9, Sandra White uh, Thank you very much President Officer To answer the Scottish Government recent discussions it's had with the UK Government on the progress of the Scotland Bill Cabinet Secretary the Scottish Government has frequent contact with the UK Government on the progress of the Scotland Bill. Most recently, I met the Chief Secretary to the Treasury on Monday con to continue detailed discussions on the substantive elements of the fiscal framework. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for the answer, and I, and I do know that uh, or understand that negotiations are still ongoing. However, does he share my concerns that, that many people are still unclear on what the impact will be on Scotland's finances, and can he confirm whether this Parliament will have adequate time to scrutinise the proposals before the next Scottish Parliament elections? That's it. Presiding Officer, the, the Smith Commission required the two governments to agree a fiscal framework, and those discussions are ongoing. Uh, we have now had five meetings between myself and the Chief Secretary to the Treasury to try to agree the details of the fiscal framework, and those discussions are ongoing, and I expect there to be um, uh, further sessions uh, set up to uh, 
to, to agree the details of the framework. The, I would give the assurance to Sandra White that Parliament will have adequate opportunity to scrutinise the fiscal framework once it has been developed in intergovernmental negotiation, which is what was required of us by the Smith Commission. The Parliament, uh, if it is to be in a position to, uh, to agree a legislative consent motion on the Scotland Bill, um, will have to have that uh, in front of Parliament by the 12th of February. So the, and the Government has made clear we will only uh, propose a motion for legislative consent if we have an acceptable fiscal framework available to put to Parliament. So essentially that task has to be completed by the 12th of February, which uh, provides Parliament with opportunity to scrutinise the details of the fiscal framework before any legislative consent motion is considered. Thanks, Malcolm Chisholm. Briefly, please. I think we all agree that the fiscal framework is uh, central and that the indi indexation of the block grant adjustment for income tax is pretty central to that. Does he acknowledge that um, the majority now, it seems, of academic experts are saying that the best and uh, most risk-free option for Scotland is uh, indexing for changes in the tax base per head? I, I tend to agree with that. Does he? I, I agree very much with the point that Mr Chisholm has made. Um, I think the debate. Sandra White made a comment about the fact that there um, is not much detail about the fiscal framework available. That, that there can't be detail about the fiscal framework available until it is agreed. But I do think there have been a number of very substantial contributions to the debate from the Scottish Trade Union Congress, from Professor Anton Muscatelli, from Professor David Bell and the Institute for Fiscal Studies, which I think provide very good dispassionate commentary on the issues that are at stake here on what I would consider to be the crucial issue, which is the block grant adjustment for income tax. And uh, Mr Chisholm asked me if I agreed with him that index deduction per capita was the best way to proceed with that, and I'm very happy to confirm to Parliament that I do. Many thanks. Question 10, Christina McKelvey. Thank you very much, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what impact the recent spending review will have on public sector finances in Scotland. John Swinney. So, as outlined previously, the Chancellor's spending plans for the period 2016-17 to 2019-20 mean that the Scottish Government's total discretionary budget will, by 2019-20, be around 12.5 per cent, or 3.9 billion lower in real terms than it was in 2010-11. Senior McElvitt. Um, I wonder if uh, Deputy First Minister can confirm that the Scottish Futures Trust has delivered massive improvements in value for money compared to Labour's discredited PFI and can he confirm that can he confirm that in line with figures published this morning that the number of pupils in poor or bad condition schools is continuing to fall under this SNP government I, I, I can confirm that point it was very welcome the, uh, the uh, improvement in the school estate that was recorded in the statistics published this morning uh, I think there was a, 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 a very welcome endorsement of the investment programme that uh, the government has taken forward. Whilst I have been the finance minister, uh, we have faced the accusation that not a brick would be laid in the school building programme. And that was the accusation that the Labour Party put to us. And of course, the school estate is now significantly improved as a consequence. I, I'm, being, I'm, I'm having it shouted at me that was in the last parliament. I, Dr Simpson, have a long memory. I remember all the things that were uh, that have been Simpson, accused of by the Labour exchange. Party, and we have, of course, uh, ensured that the school estate of Scotland is significantly improved by the well-coordinated programme of the Scottish Futures Trust, which has delivered real value for money uh, for the taxpayer in Scotland. Question 11, Dr Lane Murray. To ask the Scottish Government what discussions the Cabinet Secretary for Finance, Constitution and Economy has had with Dumfries and Galloway Council regarding its budget for 2016-17. Secretary. Uh, I have not met Dumfries and Galloway Council specifically to discuss its budget for 2016-17, but I have had a series of meetings with the Convention of Scottish Local Authorities to negotiate the overall level of the 2016-17 Local Government Finance Settlement, which I will announce alongside the 2016-17 Scottish Draft Budget next Wednesday, the 16th of December. Thanks, Dr Murray. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for his reply. Dumfries and Galloway Council had prepared a three-year budget which planned for cuts of £12.5 million in 2016-17. The Council has now been advised to expect cuts of between 4 and 5 per cent, which would equate to £20 to £25 million pound worth of cuts. What services does the Cabinet Secretary suggest that Dumfries and Galloway Council stops providing? 
Secretary. I think what I would recommend is that uh, we, we all address the financial realities of the outcome of the comprehensive spending review. And that's the best thing that I think I can suggest that we all do. Uh, because what the government will set out is uh, the, the set of decisions that we've taken in relation to the utilisation of public resources. Uh, we will do those, uh, we'll take those decisions consistent with the values of the government and in the commitments that I've made to Parliament in the course of my answers this afternoon, and do that in a fashion that is designed uh, to protect public services and to ensure that we deliver sustainable public services in our localities. And I reiterate one of the points I made in an earlier answer, that that may involve change and redesign in services, but that is uh, something that we have to contemplate as a society. Thanks. Question 12, Kevin Stewart. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government what recent discussions it has had with the UK Government regarding the introduction of fiscal measures to promote oil and gas exploration. Mr Fergus Huey. Uh, we recognise exploration in North Sea is at historically low levels and much more needs to be done to support this activity. We have long called for substantial reform in the oil and gas fiscal regime and successfully argued for the introduction of an investment allowance and a reduction in the headline tax rate. We are, however, disappointed, presiding officer, at the lack of support for exploration and continue to make the case for the need of further fiscal reform. The Deputy First Minister, John Swinney, outlined these concerns to the Chancellor of the Exchequer in a letter ahead of the autumn statement, asking him to outline his commitment to further support for the sector, as well as a firm timetable for policy reforms. Next week, uh, on the 16th and 17th December, I will be attending also in London a meeting of the industry MER UK forum to discuss the outlook for the sector, which will touch upon issues relating to exploration. Thanks, Kevin Stewart. Thank you, President Officer. At a time when we should be encouraging exploration to support the oil and gas industry, the UK government has sat on their hands. Will the Minister do everything possible to ensure that the Chancellor gets a grip, follows Norway's example, and provides exploration incentives to secure jobs in Aberdeen, the North East and beyond? Thank you. I think uh, Kevin Stewart makes, a, makes a, a good point and Oil and Gas UK have estimated that substantial exploration potential remains in the North Sea. Their estimate is that between 2,000 and 6,000 uh, million barrels of, of oil have yet to be discovered and he refers to Norway. Well, of course, it was their tax breaks for exploration that in part led to the discovery of the Johan Sverdrup field described by some as the crowning achievement of Norway's successful rejuvenation of exploration in more mature areas. This holds 2.35 billion uh, barrels of oil reserves and is forecast, presiding officer, to produce more oil than the whole UK sector by 2025, a discovery as a result of the Norwegian progressive exploration policies. Many thanks. Murdo Fraser. Uh, thank you. Last week, the Economic, Energy and Tourism Committee took evidence from the oil and gas industry, and we were told by them that, contrary to the view of Mr Stewart, thanks to the actions of the UK government, now fiscal measures are a long way down a list of their concerns. There is, however, a greater concern about the ongoing disinvestment campaigns relating to fossil fuels that we have seen on university campuses and elsewhere. Would the Minister agree with me that such campaigns are unhelpful, that they are wrong-headed, and they risk undermining the future of what is still a very important industry to Scotland, supporting tens of thousands of jobs. Minister? Well, to address the first part of his remarks, could I say that I'm extremely well aware that the industry's primary focus at the moment is to achieve uh, cost reduction without prejudicing health and safety and to achieve greater efficiency. No one is, is more aware of that than me, and I shall be discussing this at a number of meetings in Aberdeen on Monday with senior industry figures and working with them as we always do. Uh, secondly, um, I, I think uh, any kind of political point scoring at this time when so many people's jobs and families' livelihoods are at stake it is really not very clever and not very helpful. This government supports the people in the oil and gas industry in Scotland. I think most of us do. The Green Party don't, but they're not here this afternoon, so we won't hear from them. Uh, and I think we could do without the sort of gesture politics that the member refers to. Thank you very much. Question 13 in the name of Liam MacArthur has not been lodged, although an explanation has been provided.
Question 14, Colin Beattie. To ask the Scottish Government what the impact will be on its finances of not devolving the Crown Estate's share in Fort Kinnaird Retail Park. The Secretary John Swinney. The Fort Kinnaird Retail Park provides a current revenue to the Crown Estate of around £4 million a year. That this sum, which under the terms of the Smith Agreement should be available to the Scottish Government to spend, will instead be available to the UK Government. In addition, the Crown Estate's share of the capital value of Fort Kinnaird Retail Park, which was £103 million in 2014-15, will also be under the control of the UK Government. By comparison, the total capital value of the entire Crown Estate portfolio of all other assets in Scotland was £261.5 million in 2014-15. Colin Beattie. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for his response. Fort Kinnaird is highly valued by my constituents as a shopping and entertainment centre. Can the Cabinet Secretary comment on how he sees the local community benefiting if Fort Kinnaird is not devolved alongside the rest of the Crown Estate? Uh, Cabinet Secretary. Uh, I think Mr Beattie highlights a, a, an important local issue. I'm certainly concerned there will be no direct financial benefit to the community from Fort Kinnaird if it continues to be excluded from the transfer, which I believe undermines the principle of the devolution of the management of and revenue of Crown Estate economic assets in Scotland, which was a clear recommendation of the Smith Commission. Hey, thanks. Uh, question 15, Patricia Ferguson. To ask the Scottish Government what representations the Cabinet Secretary for Finance, Constitution and Economy has received from the Minister for Children and Young People regarding kinship care funding. Secretary. So I regularly speak to all of my colleagues about matters which affect the well-being of the people of Scotland, particularly our most vulnerable children. We are investing £10.1 million per annum to enable local authorities to pay eligible kinship carers the same allowances as they pay to foster carers to support the children in their care. This is tackling inequality and poverty head-on for some of the most vulnerable children and families that live in Scotland. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer, and I would not disagree with the policy intent. However, did the Minister for Children and Young People draw to his attention the fact that Glasgow City Council, who have 32% of all kinship carers living in their area, will only receive 15% of the funding allocation made to councils? And did she point out to him that this underfunding of kinship care by the Scottish Government will put pressure on other important services in the city? The Cabinet Secretary suggested to my colleague Dr Murray that cuts to local government budgets were as a result of decisions elsewhere. But the underfunding of kinship care in Glasgow is caused by a Scottish Government decision. So will the Cabinet Secretary think again? Um, I, 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 well, first, first, first of all, I um, acknowledge the seriousness of this, this issue uh, and the concerns that Patricia Ferguson has on the matter. But the allocations to each local authority were calculated using an established formula agreed with the Convention of Scottish Local Authorities when all 32 Scottish Local Authorities were still members. So the, the, this has not been a Scottish Government decision alone. We've, we, we, we've clear, I've made it very clear to Parliament over the years that the funding formula that's agreed with local government, well, is that. It is agreed with local government and it drives some of these decisions which have to be taken. So I, I hear the representations that Patricia Ferguson is making, but it is a product of a funding formula that's been agreed to by local government in Scotland. Many thanks. Question 16, Richard Lyle. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government how many businesses to date benefit from the small business bonus. Minister Ferguson. Uh, Presiding officer, the latest official statistics show an estimated 99,500 business properties benefit from paying zero or reduced business rates as a result of the Scottish Government's small business bonus scheme, saving businesses across Scotland an estimated £174 million in 2015 to 16. Thanks, Richard Lyle. Can I thank the Minister for that answer? And can I welcome the news that so many businesses in Scotland are indeed benefiting from this? Government small business bonus. Can I ask, therefore, what further action could be taken to support Scotland's thriving small businesses? Uh, Minister. Well, I, I think one very uh, clear way in which all of us across this chamber can help small businesses is pledge that the Scottish Government's uh, assurance that the small business bonus will be maintained, not just for the lifetime of this Parliament, which is nearly over, but to maintain it for the duration of the next parliament if we are re-elected, if we have the privilege of doing that. 
So I think if all parties, presiding officer, could unite in confirming that the small business bonus will be a fixture, if you like, free of party politics and will continue to 2021 and take it from the realms of partisan party politics, that more than anything else will provide assurance, uh, long-term stability that small businesses in Scotland require. A very brief supplementary, Kenny Gibson. Officer. Uh, the Minister will be aware that the Federation of Small Businesses said that at the peak of the recession, one in six uh, small businesses would have went bust without the small business bonus scheme. What would have been the impact on the Scottish economy if that had happened, as Labour recommended when they voted against the small business bonus scheme? Brief answer to, please, Minister. It, the impact would have been disastrous. Many thanks for that brevity. Uh, when we will now move to the next item of business, as that concludes question time, portfolio questions. And the next item of business is a debate. Thank you. Mr. Kelly, point of order. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Uh, I rise to make a point of order in relation to the statement from Derek Mackay, Transport Minister, on the Fourth Road Bridge yesterday. In response to a question from Alec Johnson about cancellation of planned maintenance works, Mr. Mackay stated that work that would have been covered by the cancelled maintenance contract was not where the fault uh, on the bridge occurred. However, in a Good Morning BBC Good Morning Scotland interview this morning, Mr Mackay said that work planned under the maintenance contract cancelled in 2010 would have covered the area where the fault occurred on the bridge. Clearly, these statements are contradict contradictory. Uh, this is a serious matter. It would appear that Mr Mackay has misled Parliament. And I would therefore ask, uh, I would therefore ask uh, Deputy Presiding Officer, that Mr Mackay return to Parliament before close of business this evening to correct the record and give an open and transparent explanation as to the impact of planned maintenance works on the Fourth Road Bridge. I thank uh, Mr Kelly um, for his point of order. Um, clearly, uh, Mr Mackay's statements are a matter for Mr Mackay and only for him. Uh, so, therefore, this, as you, Mr Kelly will also know, this is not a point of order. However, you have nonetheless made your point. So, we will now move to the next item of business.